Okay, welcome everybody. So like I said, I'm Andrea Henderson. I'm being joined here with Melanie Cervantes, a local artist. Uh, I'm going to in introduce her in a minute, but before we do that, I wanna let you all know a little bit about crisis support. So we're the crisis hotline for Alameda County. Um, we were established in 1964, maybe. And um, we are also the 988 number. So we are the 24 hour local crisis hotline for Alameda County. Um, and we are on Ohlone to Chenyo territory. So before we get started, we wanna take a moment to acknowledge that we are on Ohlone land. We wanna acknowledge that this land was taken. We wanna acknowledge that the Ohlone are the original custodians of the land. We wanna honor them for their stewardship of the land. Um, we wanna acknowledge the forced labor that was created. Um, we wanna take a moment to acknowledge the land itself. People wanna write in the chat what land they are, are on to acknowledge the original custodians of their lands, they are more than welcome to. And we wanna acknowledge also where you all are from, um, your ancestors, past, present, and emerging. And so the mission at Crisis Support is to provide a welcoming and safe environment, rooted in the belief that through collaboration with clients at every stage of service, healing is possible. Our values are caring from the inside out with open hearts and minds. We build connections and remain committed to the growth to be the best for people that we serve. And our strategic plan is to reduce barriers and stigma to receiving services. And that was a big drive for this presentation. We wanna make everything that we do as collaborative as possible with our community and as accessible to our community. Um, please acknowledge my Canvas skills. I did make this slide. <laughs> During, the th during a thunderstorm, which is why it's thunderstorm themed. <laughs> um, and so we provide not only 24 hour crisis support um, and we answer more than 65,000 calls per year. We also have a community education program. So we go all around Alameda County and we educate people about suicide prevention, how to support somebody in a crisis and about available resources. And we also have an outpatient mental health service that is staffed by interns. And we offer grief counseling, counseling for older adults um, and school-based counseling. And all of our services are free or sliding to scale and no one is turned away for lack of funds. We utilize the socio-ecological framework. Um, we wanna acknowledge that suicide prevention is not the work of the individual, but it needs to happen on the community societal level. Um, we think of this series as happening on the relational level and that we are in conversation with another person about their experience. We want to acknowledge that this person is a part of a community, as part of our community, and then we're also part of a larger society. And that having these conversations pushes back against stigma on the individual, relational, communal, communal and societal level. These are some of our upcoming talks. So our next talk is going to be our first and only in-person healing through movement and play. It's going, our next talk is telling my story of suicide prevention, which is on a Tuesday, but the following one is our only in-person happening at Kinetic Wellness in West Oakland. If you're interested, you can go to our website to sign up for that. On April 21st, we're gonna be talking with David Peters from the Black Liberation Walking Tour. And then we'll have healing through hip hop um, with Beach Rhymes and Life. May 5th, so excited. It's going to be me talking with the librarians over at 81st Avenue branch. Um, and then after that, we're going to have several more. We don't even have room anymore, but May 12th will be Music as Suicide Prevention. I believe that's going to be with the um, head of the Oakland Symphony. So again, these are all free and available to anybody who is interested. And if people are interested in learning more or supporting crisis support, you can attend our walk run. Our walk run um, fun rock, fun walk is gonna happen at Laney College. Um, it's to honor people who have lost loved ones to suicide and those who have died by suicide. It's, the point is to also help people educate um, and be able to learn more about our program. So we'll have tables for other community um, partners there. And it's just a fun chance to reduce some stigma. So if you're interested, again, go to our website. All right. So I want to introduce Melanie. 
Um, Melanie is a local artist and she will talk a little more about her life and her story, but I wanted to say, uh, as we said before we started, Melanie, we have your art all over our walls. Um, your art has accompanied me on my whole journey as a social worker. I've had prints all over. Um, they've always reflected the values that I hold really dear. And of course, they're also beautiful and amazing. And so as we put in the series together, I thought who better than to have Melanie, who I feel like I know just because I've had your art for so long. Um, and I feel like uh, you create a visual representation of hope and connection um, and protest in a way that uh, speaks to what people I think are trying to accomplish uh, in the field of mental health. Um, and so I guess I'll pass it over to you if you wanna share more about who you are and what brought you here. Yes, thank you for um, to Crisis Support Services for the invitation and for being to be able to be part of this ongoing series, but also to have this conversation, which I feel is critical. Like um, I know, especially in my world, in my lifetime, um, it hasn't been talked about enough. It's, so, I feel like somewhat of a taboo um, topic. Um, and, and really kind of when you delve deep into like the whys and what's happening and the hurts, the harms and the traumas that kind of, I think often lead to folks not wanting to stay in this world. Um, th those conversations just don't happen enough. They, they're not transparent enough. They're not um, real enough. And so I'm really um, excited to be with folks that are interested in having that conversation. I'm gonna have a little bit of help sitting at my uh, PowerPoint. Just give me a second. You need to? No. Does he not have it? It doesn't. I don't see it. Okay, so sorry, I'm it's trying to navigate using the notes that are on my PowerPoint, but a there is a feature that's usually on here. We're not finding. I guess I'm gonna have to do it without my notes. No worries. Take your time. I'm just gonna have to do it without it. Okay. It's probably the count setting, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. So I'm Melanie. Um, I am originally from Southern California, a little town uh, most people have not heard of called Lawndale. It's like sandwiched between very affluent Manhattan Beach and very working class Gardena, Hawthorne, um, and kind of like on the edge of Torrance. And I made my way up to the Bay for college, but the roots of, of uh, my family go pretty far and pretty long um, on my mom's side in central Mexico, the state of Guanajuato. Um, a little tiny town called the Lotus Hidalgo, which some folks might have heard of because it's the place where um, the cry for independence from Spain was done, oh, independence. Um, but I come from like a line of people that work the land. This is a picture from the 80s, uh, uh, cornfields at my uncle's Terreno. Uh, that's me on the far right, a little kind of cocked head, <laughs> tiny one, um, and my some of my family members. And um, on the right is a picture of uh, my mom, my sister, my grandmother, one of my aunts, 
um, this was taken in the 90s, just to kind of really ground who I am because I, I can document, I've done research to be able to see that most of the generations of my family on the matrilineal side have been born within a couple kilometers of the same place. So but my mom leaving Mexico was a huge change. It was kind of unprecedented, you know, everyone has been born, lived, loved, had hearts broken and died in the same place. And so my mom leaving, that's huge. What a, what a massive and probably really intense experience for someone in 1967, like right before kind of the world is on fire, you know, 68 things are changing all around the world. Revolutions are happening all around the world. So, and my mom's experiencing her own personal revolution. And so it's interesting because my sister and I are the first ones not to be born there. We are the first ones to grow up in a city. We're the first ones to graduate from elementary, middle school, high school, community college, and then transfer to college. So we are navigating a totally new reality for our family from one generation to the next. Um, so while we gained a lot of things, we also lost a lot of things. My sister cannot cook at all. And we come from like a line of like bakers and cooks, like folks that do that. And we, neither of us can keep a plant alive to save our lives. And it's very strange because we lost in a generation the knowledge of that relationship with the land of with like our plant relatives. And, you know, if I could go to any, any of my aunt or uncle's houses, they all grow food, even if they're just have a little small backyard. And so I like to say that story a little bit because people often just want to um, celebrate the fact that we both graduated college, which is great. It is great. But I also want to say it didn't come without a cost or a price. We lost something in that. Um, you know, there was a while also when I was growing up before I entered into school, uh, I was a monolingual Spanish speaker. It, I, I wasn't learning English until really I entered into the school system. Sesame Street really helped that a lot, but it was traumatic because first I was placed into a bilingual classroom and then I was yanked from that and dropped into an English only class. And for the first, I don't know how long in first grade when I got put into an English only class, I just cried in the corner of the classroom. I felt misunderstood. I have a very clear moment because I made a friend in that classroom that I've stayed friends with all this time. And I, and I remember telling him, they just don't understand. And so I think those are some of the like early traumas that made um, things really hard. And in fact, this picture of me with a little punch mustache is probably around that age. Where, uh, this is me at my home in, in Lawndale. Um, I put that as a context because people often ask, how did you become an artist? And I think it's an important part of this um, conversation that we're having today. And it's really hard to kind of like pinpoint that because what does that mean? You know, I've always loved drawing. I've always loved playing with color. I've just creative endeavors just draw me in so much. And so this is one of the earliest drawings that my mom found. It, it was a drawing of a, a heart or multiple hearts that I sent to my grandfather, still learning how to write. I was you know, figuring out how to spell abuelito. Um, but I like to put this here because it's like, well, you know, it's probably always been in me. Um, it's always been there and hungry to create. And it, but it wasn't until like I turned 26 and I was a transfer student from community college and landed at UC Berkeley as my transfer school. I met my mentor, Celia Rodriguez, um, who really just has an incredible pedagogy. And I think much of where I'm at is owed to her because instead of just writing about 
um, other artists work and learning about the history of art, which we did, we were also tasked with making work ourselves. And that was really where I started to take it more seriously, where I really started to put more energy into making work, but it wasn't without struggle. I really resisted being called an artist, partly because everyone around me was creative. A lot of my color theory understanding I learned from my mom going to the swap meet to buy fabrics for the clothes that I would wear because she made all my clothes until I was like a teenager and started thrifting and I had a job, <laughs> you know, t-shirts at the mall, jeans. Um, but I learned how to pick out fabrics for my outfits because, you know, if I picked something uh, funky, I would have to wear it, you know, it's like I was given the responsibility <laughs> right away. Um, but I also learned like how to do math, like fractions and energy, because I'd have a little budget. Here's how much fabric you need and all that stuff's done with fractions. And this is, the, you know, the yardage for what you want. You want a little skirt, a little top. And so that was much of my arts education, I think, um, came from those experiences with my family, like my mom at the swap meet. And so how do I give credit? You know, it wasn't just in the kind of like big public institution that is UC Berkeley. It was in the swap meets at the Redondo Beach drive-in that I was gaining this knowledge. Um, so after I graduated from UC Berkeley, I decided I really wanted to learn how to screen print. And I enrolled back in another community college class. I took the class on a Saturday uh, so that I could work. And I, I learned actually from um, someone who was very active in the Black Arts Movement in the 60s and 70s. It was the last class he taught. And I didn't know any of that until later. And I was like, oh, I, I had no idea who I was studying under. It was really incredible. Um, and then shortly after I met Jesus Parraza, who um, is my partner, um, and we're partners in many ways. We're partners in the project that's called Dignidad Rebelde, which folks might have heard of as the, you know, the art project that we engage in, the collaborative space that we convene. Um, and we've been doing that since 2007. But immediately, as soon as we started hanging out, we were making collaborative artworks. And I think it was really incredible because we are able to work in a way that we don't have clashes of ego. Um, and I think that's one of the rare things is like, we're really just interested in, in moving the work along. And so we don't fight about like, oh, this should be this way or that way. It's like, oh yeah, that's cool. Let's keep building on it. And so that's very healing because I think it's very rare um, and I think doubly rare that like romantic partners can collaborate this way because sometimes you can find a partner like this um, that, that will work collaboratively, but we're just really lucky that we um, are able to do the work that way. And so one of the things um, that I wanted to highlight about how we work is because we're really, you know, sometimes people think they need that or about this shorthand for saying Jesus Barras and Melanie Cervantes, but we don't really see it that way. We actually see it as um, convening a space and facilitating a space that is often ephemeral that allows people to come in and out of it. Um, and that the that collaboration between all of the people that we bring together um, is what makes up Dignidad Rebelde. And part of what we're bringing in as facilitators is the understanding that what happens when you gather with folks is actually a horizontal process, not a vertical one. Like we all come with knowledge. We all come with experiences. We all come with something to teach. We come with gifts. We come with stories. And that's what's beautiful about building community through an art-based practice. Um, and, and often you don't get to see, you know, the process. You don't get to see how you built community, how you shared, like how we open up ourselves and actually really sh shed a lot and share the wounds that we have had and the trauma that we've endured often because of like institutionalized and structural oppressions. 
And we do that, like we, we come together and we are vulnerable with one another in order to heal, right? We don't wanna just stay stuck in that. We do it in order to heal. And part of one of the like kind of tenets, the things that we believe in is that um, one of the mechanisms for healing um, that we are really committed to and that we see our art um, supporting and amplifying is organizing, right? When you get enough people who have been hurt and harmed by a policy or by a set of practices, they're gonna be the ones that have the solutions because they've been the most impacted by those things. And so what happens when we do these um, gatherings of folks is that we're able to transform that hurt and healing into a place of power. And so that for me, because that's what I, as a, a practitioner, like as someone who's making art, that's what has been the gift that making art on a consistent basis, because that's the difference that I would say when you go back to the little girl with the bunch of stash drawing. And the person that I am now is that I have just a more consistent, more time invested in, in doing it is that there was a period in my life where I didn't have that consistency and what those feelings of pain and trauma and hurt, I wasn't able to deal with them in a productive manner. And in fact, the older that I got, um, I think I turned to things that were actually even more self-destructive and and like I I added onto the harm by by doing self-harm instead of um, having a means to to heal. And so for me, being able to have an art practice is a way that's restorative, right? It restores my spirit. It restores a sense of being empowered enough to change the conditions that led to the harms and hurt that I had. And um, it makes me feel like I don't have to just be a victim of my circumstances. Cause I can remember the first thought that I had that was suicidal, I think I was seven and I was little, I was little. And I, it's like a crystal clear memory. And it was like, based in an experience that was like racist and sexist and like was in school and no one did anything about it. And so I think now, you know, I wasn't equipped then to be able to, to name it the way I am now, but like that is an example of like how I feel like the art has helped me think through my own memories and kind of organize my thoughts and then think like, what is it that I can do? And I think that for me, if I get to the very core of what I believe this, this is why I believe this is an important practice is because I can do that now, instead of turning to um, numbing myself from the pain, I am more alive, more aware and more empowered to do something and that it's not a singular experience. It's not just me um, in a room of my own <laughs> uh, doing what I do. It's a collective experience because often the harms are also collective, right? But what is beautiful about this tradition, because I also wanna acknowledge that we're not, you know, like we do printmaking and we sustain a tradition that has been happening in our community for at least 100 years, if not more, um, printmaking and screen printing in particular that is uh, socially engaged, is being done with other people, is being done collectively, but also that's actually naming issues and highlighting solutions and making calls to action. Like that has been happening for a long time and we um, have been mentored by folks that did it before us and that are still doing it. And so the, we kind of like joined that effort. And there's folks that are in younger generations, like my partner now teaches at UC Berkeley, the classes that I took where I was awoken to the idea that I could be an artist. Um, 
And so he, it's, it's really interesting because I get to hear his perspective on the other side of it, right? Where I was like the student <laughs> and I get to hear him talk about the students that he's engaging with. And I'm like, you know, maybe that'll awaken in them the way it, it awoke in me. And, and I started to like believe, yes, I could, I could do this. I, you know, this is just have to be in this class. It doesn't have to end here because I've never felt more in love with living this life than I have um, being able to make this work. And that was such a gift. And part of why it's a gift is because, you know, I'm living this life in the current conditions that exist, where someone like Brianna Taylor can be killed by police without um, the full account of accountability. Um, but, you know, even beyond the accountability, like this should have never happened. And um, in the past, I would say, like when I was a young person, um, I can think of so many memories where I see how the abuse of power from an institution that is supposed to, at least in name, you know, keep people safe, uh, that it did so much harm. You know, I saw my dad get harassed at the public library and be asked to leave because he was read as homeless because he was in a sweatsuit, but, and he was sitting with other homeless folks. Um, and, you know, being like, I don't know, I must have been like eight years old and saying like, why does anyone have to leave? No one did anything wrong. And experiencing the moment where my mom like literally like put her body in front of mine and understanding why she felt that was a threat. Like one, um, me even challenging <laughs> as a little kid, uh, these armed police officers in the library, me noticing that the reason they came was because the librarians called the police on this group of men and starting to understand that power dynamic. So all I felt was desperate and powerless. Um, and I can, I can think of like many other anecdotes, you know, as I continue to get older and older about witnessing injustices and feeling like I couldn't do anything about it. And so fast forward to my life now, where these things are still happening, right? And it's maybe worse. And now what I feel I can do is I can amplify a story of what's happening and frame it in a way that is not harmful, that I can actually ally with people that are doing a different part of it, which is organizing a set of demands, you know, like here in this example is in Louisville and to follow up and see how else I can continue to assist because they're using the art as a tool in, in the organizing. And, and oftentimes, um, you know, even do something for those that are left behind. So originally some of this, these works were done after Oscar Grant was killed here in Oakland. And, um, you know, it was like a response to call out to take action. But then we met some of his family members who said, please keep doing this. And so if you want to know part of the reason why his image was memorialized the way it was, was because his family wanted it to be. And so those of us that were engaging in that way said, yes, that's what we'll do. That's so that's the task. And we did it collectively. You know, we would <laughs> set up tables on the corner of the street or in a shoe store, wherever we could. And we said, like, let's mourn together. Let's grieve together. And let's fight as hard as we can so this doesn't happen again. And unfortunately, it keeps happening. And so I think I, I selected some of the works that are about this, um, yeah, just this heavy, heavy grief and mourning, you know, the, the way that people who are fighting to make deep and lasting change in their communities where they're at, like Berta Cáceres and Mariele Franco, who were targeted and assassinated 
for doing that. Like it, it's incredibly heavy. It's incredibly hard. Like, especially when you're, you're taking up that task in your community and it can be demoralizing. And for me, again, it's like, how do I not get stuck? Because I had a long period of my life where I just felt stuck in that feeling of being demoralized, of feeling defeated. And so for me, um, the transformation happened when I was able to like make a mark <laughs> on a paper that, that, that started me on a path to like, yeah, like telling stories through pictures and and putting the pictures together and maybe putting a slogan out or echoing a slogan because a lot of the times the words um that are visible are actually words that are out in the street and so for me it's almost like holding up a mirror to the beautiful resistance that i see in the world the resistance and um kind of rootedness in knowing that we are participants in the process of emancipating ourselves from those that are trying to destroy us right and that we can do that together and so there's a kind of full range and gamut of um struggles of self-determination of of dreams and visions, like the salmon coming back to Mount Shasta, of actually finally bringing the salmon back um, to the Winnem and Wintu tribe. Like they had a vision for that. And now they're finally getting, starting to get it done. And so like being able to also kind of engage because I think, you know, like I was looking at the circles and I'm like in the community, there's actually lots of communities within com that community circle, right? Um, and, and folks all have like different ways that they engage based on their worldviews, based on what their community wants, um, based on what, what their community is experiencing and what, and that, but that's an interconnected web of communities um so it's it's really beautiful because um the pieces kind of run the gamut that way um in terms of like the types of issue and they're global right like um i'm an internationalist in my politic because we live in a globalized world you know the things that happen in other parts of the world affect us you know like uh, here where we're at in the bay and and vice versa like i think um you know to not just focus on the problems but also on the solutions like we know the bay area can act as like a bellwether right like um some of the triumphs that we have they end up signaling things for people all around the world like we we have we have just the interesting experience of being in this time where um, global communication has really shrunk the space <laughs> and like we talked to we talked to organizers in indonesia that are saying yeah we watch really closely and it helps us learn about what we can do to like protect the sacred mountain here what you're doing there and so that is incredible to me because um for me i think you know, in the context of this conversation around um, suicide prevention, like I, I really see that as like, just like the tip of the iceberg, um, because it's so many things, right? It's all of the different ways that healing can happen, you know, therapy is part of it, but then it's also like our ceremonies and rituals that exist in our communities, you know, like this piece on the left, La Cultura Cura, it goes back to like, you know, the, the Mexican sage, right? That that's like key to like <laughs> where, where you are and, and how I started, right? It's about being rooted in where you are. And then on the right is a, is a altar that we built with all things that are, are from us that maybe we forget are like really important, but are very familiar. The aloe, 
the nopales, the corn. Like we, a lot of the times we encounter these things maybe in our kitchens and we think, oh, we don't know any of our traditions. We don't know, we don't have memory of any of those things. And we do, we just don't talk about them that way. And so being able to be rooted in our culture that way, it, for me has been um, an incredibly healing process. You know, and the ceremonies that are, that have been pro since time immemorial in all of the different communities, um, been the ways that we've be, been able to engage um, hurt and to heal. Like when we sing songs that have been sung for thousands of years, that are like love and appreciation songs to the earth, right? And that we are part of the earth. Like that to me is part of what it means to, yeah, really engage and, and prevent um, being at the place of wanting to leave this place, right? wanting to leave this world. Um, and it's not the only thing, right? Like um, that's why for us, like, doing the collective work because not everyone has access or knows how to engage those processes or even know where they connect to it. Um, so lots of opportunities to enter into that uh, are important. And so I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about recent struggles that I had. Like I never actually talked to anyone about feeling suicidal until um, after I was diagnosed with cancer. And I was diagnosed with cancer on my 40th birthday. Um, it was not what I was expecting coming into my fourth decade. Um, it was a very rare form of lung cancer. It kind of came as a shock. I had just quit uh, my job, which was actually part of like a almost 12 year career in order to pursue art full time. You know, I took a big leap and a big risk, and then I started feeling sick almost right away. You know, something wasn't right. Um, and I, I, you know, eventually found out what it was. And, um, you know, I think I switched slides, actually. This is a, <laughs> this was supposed to be the first slide. Um, and so, um, you know, went from ha having two happy lungs to having one that needed attention. And so that kind of just, ended up being this moment where I really had a lot of time to do self-examination. This was like a couple of years before COVID hit. Um, luckily, uh, it was like an incidental finding. I actually went in because I thought I was having heart issues, which turned out to be, I was just sore from carrying a heavy backpack, which was great. I'm like, I'm so glad I try to be Mary Poppins and carry the world in my bag because if it wouldn't have been for that, they wouldn't have found it. Um, it's a, it's very common for it to be found very late stage. And so I was able to have surgery and I have continued to have uh, scans that say no evidence of disease, which is wonderful. And I hope that just keeps being the theme for the rest of my life. So what I was going to say is that, you know, in the time of healing from the surgery, I just had a lot of time with myself where I wasn't able to do a lot because it, was, it busied myself a lot in the years prior to that. Like I was busy when I was in college all the time, busy when I was working. And then all of a sudden I just had to confront all of these memories, all of these feelings. And then everything came up to, to the surface. And that's when I finally like admitted to my partner, you know, I've, I've had struggles with feeling suicidal since I was a kid and I've never ever talked to anyone about it. Um, and that was huge because I think for most of my life, I felt like if I was seriously going to consider leaving, like I couldn't have anyone prevent it. And that was very dangerous, right? Um, and so that, that moment where I chose to tell the person that I love <laughs> so, so much, you know, this secret that I had held after having such a traumatic and hard time with like being diagnosed, um, it was very sad, but it also felt hopeful. Like for the first time I was like, you know, 
I'm going to admit that I've struggled with this. And in admitting that, like, then there's more that we can do. Um, so part of what was really um, important to me as I was healing both physically from the surgery um, and couldn't really do what I normally did. Screen printing is very physical, um, somewhat demanding was I started carving little tiny stamps that I could like do with this movement. <laughs> and um, I started thinking about if I focus on what's helping me get through this, like, what is that? And so nopales were part of that. Like I was eating a lot of them because they really help regulate your blood sugar. There's just so many things that are good about them. But then I also started thinking about like, how do they live? They live in the harshest of conditions right? Extreme cold, extreme heat. And yet they can, you know, the tunas, they can hydrate you. And the, yeah, the um, pad of the cactuses are incredibly nutritionally dense. And so I thought, wow, there's this resilient plant that when I make it part of me also helps in helping me be resilient as I kind of recover from um, a very, very heavy <laughs> experience and a, a very intense thing for my body. Um, so yeah, these were, were flipped. So that was just one way that I stayed engaged because I think um, another aspect of our practice that is really important is how we bring not just our minds, um, but our entire bodies into the process, right? Because the body is like where we carry a lot of the emotion, right? We feel it in our guts. There's tons of neurotransmitters in the gut, more than in the brain. So when we say that, that's just not a turn of phrase. That's a scientific fact, right? So we, you get that gut feeling something's not quite right. That's, a, that's evolutionary wisdom, right? That our bodies can, can take our memories, our lived experiences, all of that, and like synthesize it into like having a funny feeling, you know? And that we call it instinct. It's like, it's a wisdom. And so uh, this is an example of how like I followed up doing that little stamping process once my body changed. And so I've been doing that more and more, revisiting things that I had done before um, in a new place. And I think I'm ready to do another version of this because it helps kind of track like the physical, emotional and spiritual healing right that has happened because I think I'm in a very very different place now than I was when I first made them and um I just feel like it's important it's almost like a diary <laughs> it's like a visual diary uh that I can get to and that I can share with the world too and then it actually helps open up other people's stories of what they see what they feel and and that is where I think healing really happens um, is that it starts to become more collective, right? Even if I did those by myself as I was healing, um, once we are engaging, it's, it transforms. It transforms from just being an artifact of my own experience to being an invitation for a collective conversation. Uh, so this is an old quote, but I wanted to keep it um, because when I first shared this, it was still in process. I hadn't started printing it and I made it in 2018. Um, but it, it's, it captures so perfectly um, how I followed up from having that conversation with Jesus about feeling um, suicidal and how I, had been, how I was struggling in the healing period after my surgery, because part of what was really hard uh, for me was being so isolated. I had to be isolated because I couldn't even catch a cold after surgery because I'd get very sick and I had like so many lung issues even before having uh, the diagnosis of the lung cancer. So I, pe people would come, but I wouldn't see them. So I became incredibly isolated. And I think that's um, for me, definitely, I'm I'm very social being um, in interconnection and relationship is like the core 
important thing in my life. It's like, I, I really need it in order to feel healthy and strong. And so um, in order to process that, I needed to do things for myself. And so this piece was really intended to go up as a reminder in my own home while I was struggling. Because I was still struggling even though I admitted it, right? And, you know, I just imagined having it up on my wall and on the dark days, reminding myself the world's better with you in it. And it was incredible because like, I was saying before, like it was a very personal, very intimate um, piece to make. You know, it was less public and connected to things outside. But after I made this, it just broke open all these stories from people. And we started just talking about like, you know, the disproportionality that exists, right? Like, the way that there's like a higher incidence of trying to commit suicide for Latinas, the way that like in Hawaii, there's like very particular ways that like the disproportionate numbers play out, the way that in Black communities and Black youth, like if you go through all the communities and you start to see a picture of um, what is happening, right? But without the context of knowing, like, there's actually policies and practices and history, a heavy, heavy weight of history that informs that, you don't get the full picture. It's just like, oh, high incidence of suicides. Like one thing I, I was I was doing a talk recently and the question came, what do you feel is like one of the most pressing issues in indigenous communities? And like my gut told me this, but then I was like, I want to look into it. And the incidence of um, of suicide rates in indigenous communities had risen like skyrocketed in the past few years. And but then I look at like I'm like, but what are the struggles that are happening, <laughs> you know? And what are the conditions? And so then when you have that full picture, it it told me something else. So like to to yeah re reveal publicly what I had revealed to Jesus was healing um, because I, I was owning it in a bigger way, right? And that meant there would be more people to hold me when I was struggling and for me to hold as well. Um, again, like the collective part of the work is so important. So I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna talk about these. I'm just gonna go through them because I know we're running out of time. Um, these are just pieces that I continue to make after, um, yeah, healing. I prayed for an open heart to receive all the help that I was getting and all the love I was getting. I started doing pieces that came from a place of gratitude uh, instead of being mad just at the fact that people celebrate Thanksgiving and colonialism. Uh, I started to really focus more on the empowered subject even more um, when facing issues that feel overwhelming and make us feel powerless. Um, started to talk about really hard issues like child sexual abuse and how we don't talk about it in our families and in our communities and, um, and what it means to break open that levy <laughs> and, and start to talk about it. Uh, I started a series after even more traumatic events, there was a fire in our building. Uh, you know, COVID came and then there was a fire and I was displaced and had to live in a hotel for a year. And what came out of that was like, I needed to make pieces that affirmed young people that get made fun of and that are hurt because I went back to that little like seven, eight year olds that had her first thought of suicide. And so instead of coming from like, this is the pain, it's like, this is the kindness, this is the love. This is the affirmation that I wish I had around me, you know? Um, and starting to point at the healing is there. We don't see it sometimes. Let me, let me lift some of it up. It might right, be right next to you. And so I continue like in the last, uh, well, in 2023, I've really just gone double down on doing pieces that are about who I am, and the worldview that I have and the places where I think we have healing and tradition and um, yeah, just affirming that 
and kind of always having the space and time to talk about what's happening in the world, uh, to take a position, to not be afraid to say, this is wrong, this is where I stand. Um, and to, and to, to again, come from the place I know that is true, that it's about like that circle being whole and saying like, you know, you belong because that was what I needed and that what I need, continually need. Um, and yeah, so that's, uh, that's my presentation. I'm sorry I went a little bit long. Melanie, thank you so much. I think we're just really overwhelmed with gratitude. Um, I'm feeling so touched and moved uh, with what you shared and so much of what you said, you said so much more beautifully than we would ever say. Um, but I wanna acknowledge what you said about healing coming from culture, the need for belonging, the need for being seen, and particularly the ways in which you acknowledged um, centering people who as agents, not just as people who are as oppressed, but centering their actual resistance in your art. You've always done that. I think it's why it's always spoken to me. Um, I know we don't have that much time, but does anybody have a question or have one thing maybe they wanna to say to Melanie before we say goodbye? I just want to say to you, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, oh, yeah, you can. Uh, my, actually, my name is Joan. Forget It's like I'm in jail with that number, but forget it. <laughs> um, I, just I just want to tell you that I'm so touched because the genuineness, both of your expressing your own experiences and then your art together is just a really powerful. And I think the more you do this kind of work and share it with people, the more powerful it'll be. So thank you. Thank you. I also wanted to say, I hope it's okay to share this, Melanie. We didn't know that you had a personal experience when we invited you. Um, that's new to, yeah, that's yeah. new to me. And I, I was so touched to have you share that. Um, and I think it just speaks to the fact that people do think about suicide, particularly when they're at, at the intersection of so many oppressions, particularly when they're young. And I really wanna acknowledge you for naming the higher rates of suicide among youth of color, among indigenous youth. And as I'm sure you know, all of the studies that also show that, you know, once people are more deeply connected to their culture, their language, their land, those suicide rates, rates decline um, and that your art is, is a part of that. My cat is being really annoying right now. Um, <laughs> any any last things? I see people kind of are popping on screen. So I yeah, wanna... I don't know if other folks had <laughs> comments or questions. I have a question. Thank you so much, Melanie. This has been amazing. And um, where can we buy your art? Oh, let me put the URL in the chat. Thank you for that question. Yeah, so I'm a full-time artist. That's how I live. So I appreciate you asking that question. Yeah, I think um, the other thing I didn't really get to talk too much about that I'll just add in like 20 seconds is that, you know, we also try, are trying to teach teachers like, and I don't mean like formally teachers, but teach people who will also teach. Like we did a class with six organizations with 12 organizers so that they could engage it into their organizing. We were able to like figure out during the pandemic how to do all of this production without having like what is traditionally in a studio. And so now six organizations in the Bay are geared up and have training. And we hope to keep doing that in the future. We partner with an organization called the Center for Political Education to do that because I think it's like not enough for me to have my practice. I'm like, there's lots of people out there that didn't know they had that in them or don't, maybe don't know or maybe kind of know but don't know how to keep it going. And so that's the dream. Let many flowers bloom, right? Uh, so that's another aspect that I think is important. Right. Any last questions or comments from the audience? All right, getting a lot of thanks and acknowledgements.
and wanting to use your art in our social media, which we've already thought about. <laughs> All right, and Nargis is dropping in the chat ways to follow Melanie on socials. And then we have a link to her store in there as well. Cool. Oh yeah, someone from the library is here. Yes, I, I, I should say that was, um, you know, an isolate, it actually like my local city library was terrible. So what ended up happening, cause that was one of the things that really, I would say the library saved my life. Those were the places where I actually was able to find new worlds, new imagination, learn new things, learn about my history. Uh, I just started going to other libraries. So I got library cards to like three other cities. And that was like my Disneyland. Like if I misbehaved, the threat was we're not going to take you to the library. And so I would just, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> so I love libraries, but I do share that because, um, yeah, like every, just, just like everyone can be an agent, H, agent for good, they can also be an agent <laughs> for bad and for harm, you know? Um, so I, I share it because we know, right? We see in the news cycle, things like this continue to happen. Um, and they're horrible and they mark people like this has been so many decades and I can still feel all the feelings I had when I was a kid. Right. I appreciate you sharing that hard story. Yeah. All right, Melanie, we're going to thank you so, so much for your time. We're so appreciative of everything that you've shared and the ways in which you've shared your art with us. Um, and again, like throughout Alameda County, I see your art everywhere. And I really feel like so many people are uplifted by your work. I want to thank you again. <laughs> and we'll say goodbye to everybody. <laughs> <laughs>